everyone. Thank you for coming to Symposium and to listen to Jonathan and Sadika's talk. Sadika and Jonathan are juniors who worked at the Harvard Medical School Department of Pathology last summer where they aimed to identify sex-specific effects of cancer treatments. They were interested in this topic because they hope to address the current lack of knowledge about the sex-specific effects of cancer treatments. One challenge they faced while working was coercing large volumes of diverse data into formats suitable for their use when developing their framework. They were selected to compete in the 2015 International Science and Engineering Fair and were selected as 2014 Siemens regional finalists for their work. They both hope to continue research in bioinformatics and study computer science in college. Please join me in welcoming Sadika and Jonathan. And my name is Sadaka Maladi. Today we're presenting our project, Systematic Rational Identification of Sex-Linked Molecular Alterations and Therapies in Cancer. <clears throat> According to Baggio et al., sex is a known factor in the progression of cancer. However, most current studies of cancer overlook sex. Only 20% of guinea pigs used in animal testing are female. Furthermore, the FDA excluded women from phase one and two human clinical trials from 1977 to 1993. As of 2010, only 37% of trial participants in nine major medical journals were female. Finally, only as of May 2014 did the NIH begin to address this bias by requiring that grant proposals include the number of specimens of each sex being used in the experiment. Current discovery of sex disparities in cancer treatment is hindered by trial and error screening of individual drugs, pathways, and genes. Furthermore, there is no method for multi-cancer screening, even though the FDA has approved many treatments for the, for the treatment of multiple cancers. To address these shortcomings, we developed a novel interdisciplinary framework integrating three separate analyses, computational and statistical genomic analyses, ingenuity pathway analysis, or IPA, and Lynx Cloud connectivity map software. Using our framework, we were able to rationally predict three types of perturbagens, type one, which is more effective in males, type two, which is more effective in females, and type three, which is effective in both sexes. Our framework yielded successful and independent predictions of one known type two and two known type three drugs, as well as four novel type three genetic constructs and four novel type three drugs. We'll now go over each step in detail. So for our genomic analysis, we considered 17 cancers, each with, uh, each with at least 10 patients in each set. However, our IPA and Lynx cloud analysis required comparisons of tumor and normal gene expression. Thus, for those cancers, with those analyses, we only considered seven cancers, each with at least 10 additional non-neoplastic patients of each sex. Thus, each of those analyses had, uh, had at least 40 patients, roughly the size of a phase two human trial. We analyzed genomics data in three categories, gene expression, DNA copy number, and DNA methylation. All genomics data came from the Cancer Genome Atlas, or TCPA. We performed the Wolfoxon rank some test with respect to sex, doing cancer-specific few values of genomic sex disparities. Then we performed the Benjamin Hoffer correction, which adjusts for multiple signations testing, doing Benjamin Hoffer or BH values. And finally, to quantify the magnitude of genomic sex disparities, we calculated medium fold changes in all three data categories. This graph summarizes our cancer-specific results. The number of genes with significantly sex disparity expression in each cancer ranged from 26 in kidney chromophobe to over 1,600 in kidney renal clear cell carcinoma. Thus, sex disparity gene expression is indeed widely prevalent in all cancers considered. Recall that one of our goals was to extend our analyses across multiple cancers. To do this, we used Fisher's method, which aggregated our cancer-specific p-values into pan-cancer p-values. In addition, we calculated pan-cancer fold changes across all 17 cancers considered. We found an overlap of 13 genes to have significant sex disparities in DNA copy number, DNA methylation, and RNA expression. Of those 13 genes, the three shown here are most relevant to cancer and its treatment. Most notably, DDX43 exhibits expression levels twice as high in males as in females. Furthermore, we see this trend in eight different cancers, suggesting the pan-cancer nature of both our analyses and our results. 
DDX43 overexpression has been shown to induce resistance to MEK inhibitors. MEK inhibitors are currently in trial for the treatment of thyroid carcinoma. Thus, we predict that females with lower DDX43 expression will be more sensitive to such treatment than males. Now, recall that we perform comparisons of tumor and normal gene expression. So, for IPA and Lynx cloud analyses, we required sensitivity and assistance signatures. However, existing gene expression profile databases from which these signatures might be derived, such as the Cancer Genome Project or CGP, contains sex bias. For instance, CGP contains 12 male, but only 4 female kidney cell lines, potentially underrepresenting the female population. So instead of using CGP, we used our own genomic results to, count, uh, to define our sensitivity and resistance signatures. Now, from prior literature, genes overexpressed in tumor relative to normals increase tumor cell proliferation and drug resistance. Conversely, genes overexpressed in normals relative to tumors decrease tumor cell resistance and increase drug sensitivity. Thus, we define our sensitivity signatures as genes significantly overexpressed in normals relative to tumors and our resistance signatures as genes significantly overexpressed in tumors relative to normals. And since these signatures were derived from the cancer genome atlas with over 2,300 male and 1,500 female patients, underrepresentation of one sex is far less likely than in CGP. Now, just as we computed can cancer genomic sex disparities, we also computed can cancer sensitivity and resistance signatures. We aggregated p-values into pan cancer p-values using Fisher's method. And we computed pan cancer full changes of median gene expression. From these in the genomic measurements, we then computed pan cancer sensitivity and resistance signatures, which we used in our analyses. Using cancer-specific male and female resistance signatures, we then applied Ingenuity Pathway Analysis, or IPA, to discover pathways significantly associated with neoplastic expression and tumor resistance. IPA leverages the Ingenuity Knowledge Base, which contains over 8.5 million findings from 4,000 different journals. From the most significantly associated pathways, we then manually screen using literature to find the ones most relevant to cancer and its treatment. Notably, we found that the liver exreceptor LXR and the retinoid exreceptor RXR activation pathways were more significantly associated with male tumors, but not at all with female tumors in liver hepatocellular carcinoma. Indeed, these two, these two receptors have been identified as therapeutic targets in the treatment of cancer. Thus, we predict that males would be more sensitive to treatment targeting these receptors than females. Finally, we use links to conic analysis to rationally predict the perturbations with sex-specific sex effects. Now, Lynx Cloud draws on the Lynx Cloud 1000 dataset, which contains gene expression perturbation profiles of 20,000 small molecule compounds and 22,000 genetic constructs across 77 cellular contexts, including 59 cancer cell lines. Furthermore, for each query, Lynx Cloud only draws on the four cell lines most similar to the user query, thereby increasing the accuracy of the prediction and decreasing the possibility of sex bias. Finally, Lynx Cloud uses the Kolmogorov Smirnoff test to calculate the conductivity score for each perturbative, which quantifies the degree of similarity between the gene expression perturbation profile of that perturbative and the user query. We query Lynx Cloud for perturbatives which could upregulate our sensitivity signatures and downregulate our resistance signatures, obtaining conductivity scores for thousands of perturbatives in each sex. Now, a positive conductivity score indicates sensitivity, whereas a negative conductivity score indicates resistance. Thus, type 1 perturbatives have positive male and negative female conductivity scores. Type 2 perturbatives have negative male and positive female conductivity scores. And type 3 perturbatives have positive scores in both sexes. We queried Lynx Cloud for, we made 5 predicted type 1 and 5 predicted type 2 perturbatives with maximum conductivity score differences, as well as 5 predicted type 3 perturbatives with maximum conductivity score subs. From the returned perturbatives, we then looked for literature corroborating our findings to validate our framework. In liver hepatocellular carcinoma, serafinib is FDA approved for treatment. We calculated a male conductivity score of 92 and a female conductivity score of 89. Thus, we predict that serafinib is a type 3 perturbative, meaning it is effective in both sexes. Indeed, the protein binding of serafinib, thought to be responsible for its anti-tumor effects, was found to not be correlated with sex by a previous study. In lung adenocarcinoma, we studied tamoxifen. Tamoxifen returned a male conductivity score of negative 84 and a female conductivity score of 54. Thus, we predict that tamoxifen is a type 2 perturbation, more effective in females. Tamoxifen acts as an estrogen receptor antagonist, so this prediction makes sense because females have more estrogen receptors than males. 
Indeed, Kaltagi, Rone et al. found that the IC50 value of tamoxifen was 50 to 456% greater in male cell lines than female cell lines of the same ethnicity and age. Finally, Evermolimus is FDA approved for the treatment of kidney renal clear cell carcinoma. We calculated a male conductivity score of 71 and a female conductivity score of 70, so we predicted Everolimus as a type 3 perturbation. Indeed, sex was not found to be a prognostic factor of first survival during Everolimus treatment of this cancer. We, uh, we also made several novel predictions of drug efficacy. For instance, in liver hepatocellular carcinoma, we predicted that etopside and campodecin are both type 3 inhibitors. Now, these drugs are both DNA topoisomerase inhibitors, known to completely inhibit tumor growth, though sex-specific effects have not yet been verified. Thus, our prediction is logical. Furthermore, in our pan cancer analysis, we predicted that CDK knockdown, CDKN overexpression, and purvolanols are all type 3. Now, this makes sense because CDKN in inhibits the phosphorylation of CDK substrates, thereby inhibiting CDK activity. Furthermore, CDK is known to be derivative in cancers, so it is logical that CDKN overexpression is included. Finally, purvolanols are known to be inhibitors of CDK activity, so their inclusion is logical as well. Thus, in conclusion, we identified sex disparities in the genomics, pathways, and treatments of tumors, and we created a novel interdisciplinary framework in order to do so. One drawback of this approach is the lack of a clear significance threshold for links to autonomy analysis. The current threshold is 90. Some, while no predictions above this threshold were incorrect, some predictions below this threshold says that, such as tamoxifen were accurate, while others, such as excitative, were not. Thus, the threshold is specific but not sufficiently sensitive and could be improved with future work. In the future, we will also like to validate our, our predictions using live tissue experiments, as well as generalize our approach to include comparisons of drug efficacy across other demographics, such as age and ethnicity thereby obtaining a more personalized cancer treatment. So we would like to thank our mentor, Dr. Andrew Beck. We would also like to thank Ms. Anita Chetty, Mr. Chris Spenner, and Mr. Mike Kostaki, and the rest of the Parker faculty for supporting our research. And finally, we thank you, the audience, for your time. And here are our selected references. to Jonathan and Sonica for an amazing talk. We have a couple minutes if anyone in the audience has questions they would like to ask. Yeah? Uh, so how did you come up with the idea for this and the drugs that you use? you go back to the manufacturers and tell them what you want? Um, so in terms of for the first question, how we came up with the idea, um, we read the article by the NIH that I mentioned in the introduction that was released in May 2014 about how they're requiring proposals to include specimens of each sex. And so that really raised our, like, we were curious about how, why they would come up with this requirement and what the current standard for it was. And so we started doing a little bit of background research and we found all those statistics that I showed earlier. And in terms of going back to the manufacturers for the drugs, um, the FDA approved drugs that we found were type 3 perturbagens, meaning they're effective in both sexes, and so that's a good thing because that means that they're, they're approved for treatment and they work in both sexes. Um, in terms of tamoxifen, which is one of the type 2 that we highlighted, its sex disparate effects were already known. So um, we do have, um, like we said in the conclusion side, thousands of predictions, but we don't want to take them any further before we understand the mechanistic processes involved. Any other questions? No? Okay, then I'd like everyone to thank Sonic and Jonathan for an amazing talk again.